Keys to the Shop, episode 128, Terry's Top 10, How Not to Kill Your Espresso Machine, with Terry Zinowich. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio, I'm your host for the show, and I'm super excited to have you along today because we get the honor of uh, talking with Terry Zinowich. Terry is nothing short of an industry icon and coffee tech guru. We're going to be talking about his top 10 best practices that will uh, prevent your espresso machine from breaking down, how you can take care of that a very expensive piece of equipment. And when Terry speaks, we should listen. Uh, the man knows his stuff and has impacted so many lives in the coffee industry. So uh, just a really great way to spend this last Tuesday episode of 2018. Uh, I can't believe it. it's almost two years now. Uh, January 4th is when the first episode of this show aired. And again, it's really great to spend it with my friend Terry here and give you some really practical tips on how to care for your equipment. Um, I want to remind everyone that voting is still open for the Sprudgies. Keys to the Shop was nominated for a Sprudgie for Best uh, Coffee Podcast, and uh, this is such a thrilling thing. I'm so honored, and if you have the opportunity and you feel so inclined, if this show has really helped you, you can vote for Keys to the Shop for a Best Podcast in the Sprudgies. It would certainly mean a lot. Um, I'm really honored to get to serve you in this way. I'll provide a link for where to vote in the show notes. Um, also, please do subscribe to Keys to the Shop and share these episodes with a friend if you find them helpful. And uh, stay tuned also for a very generous giveaway. I'll be giving details of that at the end of this interview. Um, we'll be conducting the giveaway on Instagram. Two people will win. This is coming right from Terry himself. And uh, we'll be talking about what that is. It's, it's something that's really amazing. So um, stay tuned. Now, this episode would not be possible if it were not for our great sponsors. I want to take a moment to thank them, starting with Prima Coffee. So a Prima Coffee, they are a leading specialty coffee equipment supplier that curates the best equipment from around the world to fit perfectly with the needs of both their enthusiast and professional customers. So helping you succeed in making great coffee, whether that's at home or in the shop, is what drives them. Uh, and so if you are opening a shop or if you're getting ready to open a second shop and you need the best equipment and expert assistance to go along with it, well, then look no further than prima-coffee.com. And right now, through December 31st, customers can receive a Mazer Mini Electric Grinder in silver entirely for free with their Astoria Espresso Machine purchase. Simply add the machine and the grinder to your cart to see instant savings. This is an incredible deal, so definitely go to prima-coffee.com for more on that. And when you get ready to check out, in the How Did You Hear About Us section, mention that Keys to the Shop sent you. So thank you very much, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. This episode is also brought to you by the fine people over at Pacific Foods. They're the ones behind the Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages, which are designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards for excellence that they do demand. Whether it's almond milk, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, its ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on the coffee makes this a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. Pacific is a huge supporter of the coffee and barista community, they have been for years, and these products and, and how they perform and how they came about is just proof of that. So go to pacificfoods.com to learn more about the Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages and what they can do to help elevate the non-dairy offerings in your cafe. Thank you very much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so today we're going to be talking with Terry Zinowich of Cafe Works LLC. Terry has been involved in the espresso coffee industry for over 25 years. He is the founder or co-founder of a number of well-known industry brands, including EspressoParts.com, Olympia Coffee Roasting, Mavam Espresso Machines, and others. Uh, as an industry consultant, Terry has developed business concepts and products for companies like Slayer Espresso Machines, Xylem Flowjet, Ernex, 
and is currently a partner in Cafe Works with his daughter, Sarah Michaelman. Terry has also published a number of articles on coffee tech with Barista Magazine, Roast Magazine, World Coffee and Tea, just to name a few. He also has been a speaker and instructor with Coffee Fest uh, since 1998 and is uh, introducing some new classes in 2019. Uh, keep a lookout for those. and We'll link to some of the, what you can expect to find in those classes in the show notes. So suffice it to say that Terry has been just extraordinarily uh, influential in his career in coffee, uh, teaching us how to use the equipment we have, innovating better equipment for us to use. And today we are going to be going over those top 10 best practices for how to care for your espresso machine. This is one of those things that we constantly need to be on top of, but oftentimes we will forget and it will push things too far until it's too late. And then we've got to call somebody to come fix it. And it becomes way more expensive than it would have been to just engage in some of these preventative maintenance strategies that you're going to hear in this episode. So in this conversation with Terry, we're going to cover those top 10 things that he believes from a vast world of experience in coffee tech will be the most beneficial things for you to do to make sure that your equipment your espresso machine is running the best that it possibly can. So I'm honored and excited to share this with you. Uh, here now is my interview with Terry Zinowich. Terry Zinowich, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. Yeah, um, we are going to be talking about something that obviously you are known the world over for, and that is uh, machines. Espresso machines, uh, in particular, are going to talk about espresso machine maintenance, and um, you are kind of the guru of of this field. Um, how long have you been in the coffee industry and working on coffee equipment? Ah, uh, this year is about twenty, going into the twenty seventh year. Wow, you've yep. probably seen a lot. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen it all come <laughs> around again. So full circle now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, just all the basics that were basics then are basics now. Yeah. You know, I mean, things like, um, flow meters on espresso machines, automatic machines, if you will, oh, Volume, yeah. volu- volumetric. When I first got into the industry, uh, there was a uh, push to get people away from volumetrics and to only use semi-automatics so that you had better control of the coffee. And uh, now volumetrics or automatic machines are quite popular for, for various workflow reasons and consistency reasons that weren't given consideration a long time ago. So, yeah, it's very interesting to see. It's kind of funny how that happens. Things go yeah. in, and, in and out of vogue, um, maybe to our detriment. <laughs> we had been wiser, may just have stuck with them who could have been making better coffee. Hard to say. <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> we'll leave that one, I guess. But um, yeah, so you've got such a, a vast wealth of knowledge about the way that equipment should run, and um, you've seen people run their machines into the ground, and you know people have maintained their machines well. And uh, we want to go over your your top ten ways that you can really maintain your espresso equipment because uh, obviously this is the major investment that owners make in their coffee bars. And unfortunately when it goes down, it's a huge hit. So, um, so I want to start with obviously number one, and this is the super obvious one and it's cleanliness. Talk to us about the importance of cleanliness of your espresso machine. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the concept of a a clean, well-maintained espresso machine really, is the lead into um, or a way to quality coffee and consistency. Um, the cleaner the espresso machine, the better the coffee is going to taste. Um, chances are that um, that machine is probably going to work a whole lot better if it's well maintained and clean. Are there, are there things that you should or should not use to just clean it? Um, like, what are the basics for cleaning an espresso machine? Well, I think. Um, Using products that are formulated to clean the surfaces of, of the machine are a good idea, in particular using an espresso machine cleaner that's formulated to remove coffee oils um, versus using, say, a, a spray over-the-counter 
um, from the grocery store or something like that. Um, and then as far as, you know, the product that you would use to wipe the machine off with, you know, no paper towels, um, definitely no green scrubbies. <laughs> yeah. Green scrubbies seem to make their way to uh, mirror polished stainless steel sometimes. And it's something that just never goes away. You'll, you'll see it forever unless somebody uh, polishes it really well. <laughs> so, so yeah, just, you know, mild, mild cleaning uh, detergents and um, soft cloths take care of the machine really well. Nice. Yeah, that's, a, that's super important, that what you just said there, because uh, number two on your list was surface cleaning the espresso machine. And, and it's certainly tempting to... Um, break out something abrasive if there's stubborn scale buildup in a corner somewhere or you, you just can't get it. I've seen people take a knife or something like that to try to like you know, break that stuff off. I guess you wouldn't be in that position if you were maintaining a clean machine. You wouldn't have to worry yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't have to be scraping the surfaces of everything that's maintained well. But what's interesting is that, you know, um, one of the most powerful cleaners available to a person is steam and you're working with a, an espresso machine that's loaded with it. Really? Yeah. So, um, surgical tubing connected to the end of the steam one used in those hard to get to areas where stuff has been built up and caked on, um, is a pretty incredible tool. Wow. I'm going to try this for sure. And, uh, I'll be careful, but my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing to remember. You're working with live steam, so gloves and and safety glasses, even at that point. But um, surgical tubing connected to the steam wand, activate the steam wand and point it towards what it is that you're trying to clean. Nice. It's going to look dramatic in the cafe. And there's actually a tool on the market that has a scrub brush on the market uh, that does a similar thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've seen it out there before. I'm, I'm not I'm not totally sure who makes it, but. Um, it's a pretty cool looking device. Nice. So uh, third on your list is drain maintenance. What what do you recommend people do to maintain the drain of their espresso machine? Because that thing is pretty gross when it gets gross. Exactly. And, you know, I, I kind of preface this that a lot of technicians will state that, you know, their work stops at the drain box. They don't, they don't clean drain lines and some do some don't but as you just mentioned it can be kind of a foul job so um it's at the discretion of the service tech but um the easiest way to maintain the drain line so that it doesn't become a problem is uh during the close in the evening and periodically throughout the day depending on how busy your bar is is to use a, a solution of espresso machine cleaner and hot water um mixed up into um you could use a, a milk jug, a, a steaming pitcher if you'd like, and, and dump it down the drain and into the drain box of the espresso machine. That'll clean out the line and keep the drain flowing very well. Nice. And so that's just part of your, your checklist. You put it at the end and everybody does it before they turn the lights off and you shouldn't have a problem then. Yeah, you shouldn't have a problem. And I think the other thing is to give consideration to how much uh, product you're actually expecting the drain to absorb. So if you're using it to dump milk into, um, and you're rinsing out porta filters with a lot of um, coffee grounds still in them, um, the drains will be um, harder to maintain because of the amount of debris. So if you're not putting a lot of product down the drain, um, that's the the better way to maintain it. So keep that drain looking clean. And then um, the, the one we all do, but maybe not exactly the best uh, in consistency is back flushing. Um, what, are, what are the best practices for back flushing the espresso machine? So there's a, a bit of um, effort that goes into back flushing and how often it is done. Um, so whether you're using detergent or just a clear water back flush um, is really dependent on the volume of coffee going through the machine. I'd say the average shop could probably get away with a, a midday clear water flush and an end of a day uh, detergent flush. Um, the formulation of the product um, has been tightened up quite a bit over the years to dissolve a little faster. And so what we recommend is five intervals of uh, five seconds on, uh, five seconds off. 
um, with detergent and then repeat that with clear water, five seconds on, five seconds off, um, five times. So that second rinse with just the clear water ensures that you don't have any detergent left in uh, the system that could make its way to the first coffees in the morning. Of course, in that instance, what we, we always remind people to do is, you know, part, part of your dial in is that you don't want to consume that first couple of shots out of the machine that might have detergent in it. <laughs> so that, that is the gift that keeps giving all day. So not a good thing. No, not, you don't want that kind of a clean shot. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, do you do this back flushing? Um, I know there are people who do it one way or another with or without the screen in place. Right. Um, screen in place or not screen in place. It's really kind of a personal choice. Um, I feel that you get a better job with the screen off because you'll clean the diffusion area much better during the back flushing procedure. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to go back over it, hopefully with, with a cloth and and wipe it with a, a solution of detergent as well. But um, taking the screen out, soaking, and um, giving it a, a mild scrub with a, a group brush is really the thing that needs to be done. I think I've always been told the story, a uh, horror story, of you don't want to back flush with the screen out because a de- piece of debris might make its way up into the espresso machine into the tubing and, and block some uh, some, you know vital artery of the group head is that more myth well there are particular brands that are more susceptible to that problem than others um so in in the instance of uh the marzocco product that is one that you might want to keep the screen on if you're if you're um, typically used to having a lot of uh, grounds on the back side of the screen you don't want those to make their way back up um into the uh the banjo tube area but on the newer, uh, modern Marzocco products, it's really not um, as much of a problem as it used to be. Okay. So kind of pay attention to what happens on the other side of the screen. If it's a, a lot of buildup, maybe, you know, go for the screen in. But if not, then just kind of take the screen out, scrub it, and then, you know, back flush without that screen. Yeah, exactly. And then just take, you know, and cleaning up the rest of the components out of the group, the diffusers and screens with a group brush and just a solution of uh, hot water and espresso machine cleaner. The, the idea is that you're forcing this detergent back to the three-way valve on the espresso machine, and that's why we call it back flushing, because it's pressurizing the system, pushing it all the way back to the valve and cleaning the pathway that the coffee sees. Mm. So, And basically that coffee gets back there by way of a vacuum um, as a result of the three-way valve, actually. So... It's what releases the pressure from the machine so we can pull the portafilter out and in the process creates this vacuum that can pull coffee oils and debris back to the valve and that could cause it to stick. So mm. uh, by doing this process, we're not only cleaning the group head, but we're cleaning that entire pathway. So, Well, it's interesting because the back flushing process, if you're not doing it thoroughly, you might wonder, well, I am doing it and it seems like it's soaping everything up, but if it's not really cleaning out those inner areas, you might still get some of that you know, ashy aftertaste in your espresso. Yes. Great. Back flushing. Uh, do it, do it the prescribed way. Number five on your list is, uh, the balancing of the group heads, the balancing of the use of the group heads. Right. That, that is uh, a, a really useful one. Talk to us about, um, how one would go about doing that during the course of business. Well, let's, let's say that your, your store has a two group in it and, the grinder is located on the right side. Uh, typically, the right group is going to be the preferred group and see the most use. So if, if you're a, a typical um, standard volume cafe, um, bouncing between the right and left group throughout the day will wear all the parts consistent. So you want this kind of consistent wear between the parts so that you're not chasing what you think might be grinder problems due to worn out baskets and screens. Um, so moving, moving around on the machine and making coffee throughout the day on all the groups versus just the one closest to the grinder will result in a more consistent coffee out of the machine in general. So, mm. 
And that's definitely something that you'd need to stay on top of as a manager when you're, uh, it sounds like onboarding people is critical for teaching them like, this is what you do. Like it's really tempting to just stick with what you've got next to you and not take the extra step when it's a little inconvenient to do so. Uh, I bet people just opt out of using all of them equally, even though they know they should. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. Um, you know, when we're training um, baristas for coffee preparation, we, we spend a little time in general. I mean, and when I when I say we, I'm talking about the industry as an overall. Um, we'll spend time with them training them on the maintenance of the machine, and typically it's, you know, back flushing um, and some real quick stuff. We don't really spend a lot of time talking about the hows and whys that you know, you should move around on the machine or some operators might not even know that you should do that. Or like you say, cleaning the drain. It's not a, a typical thing that you'll find on the closing sheet of a cafe. So what we're trying to do is just trying to put a little bit more of that information out there as an idea towards better coffee. So the, the more you know as a barista with regards to the equipment you're using, chances are you're going to maintain it better. You're going to not just in understanding it better, but um, being able to operate it and just the whole thing kind of comes full circle, right? So um, as part part of the barista culture in Italy, that has always been um, a very standard part of the profession is knowing as much about the machine as you do about the coffee. Oh, really? Yeah, very typical. Well, um yeah, I guess it, it just makes sense. Like you are a chef, you're going to know your knives, you're going to know your um, uh, the ovens and whatever else you're using to make the food. But it, it is interesting. It seems like there is that divide between we have a tech that takes care of that and I just do what I'm told and I don't have the knowledge that it takes to kind of problem solve on my own, least of all do a little bit more complicated uh, maintenance stuff because I'm not really entrusted with that information. Right. And that's, and that's maybe a, a weak spot in our overall view of our, the abilities of our staff, I believe. Um, when I first entered into the industry, um, it was very, very typical to find um, that baristas weren't allowed to adjust the grinder. Yes. There was no <laughs> big piece of, piece of tape that locked down the pin and said, don't touch it, you know. <laughs> Um, so we've, we've, we've come a long way from, from that. And, um, at the same time, you know, we, we should also know how to program the machines and have that, the ability to do all that because we can't count on the fact that, um, the person in charge is going to be available to do those things. Mm -hmm. So the more we know about them as the person operating the equipment, the better. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, it, it, it seems like a big upfront cost to give everybody the training to do that. But I guess if you compare it against the cost of having a machine break down uh, in an imbalanced way or altogether, it's better to have a staff full of basically technicians than not. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you give consideration to the fact that most modern espresso equipment is somewhere in the neighborhood of the twelve to $15,000 range, um, that investment into repair and maintenance courses for your staff is probably a good investment. Mm -hmm. And of course, the managers are going to probably put into place some limits when they take on that kind of empowerment with their staff. Not everybody like is in charge of doing anything they want to the machine, but right, um, yeah, yeah, I don't want somebody busting out their wrenches and trying to work <laughs> on the thing. But at the same time, you know, you should have at least an understanding of some of the basic um, aspects of the machine. Indeed. So number six, don't overstock the top of the espresso machine with cups. Um, this is something that I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just love the the way it looks. Okay. And when there's a gap there and I'm just like, oh, I need to stock the top so I can warm the cups. And uh, that's just what I think. I need warm cups. So I put them on top. Uh, but there's, there's a problem with that. So what what are we doing wrong when we're overstocking the machine? Yeah, blocking the airflow. So the, the espresso machine is going to operate um, really to its engineered and designed qualities when there's convection involved. And um, in order for the PID on some machines to work, you need to have this convection happening and kind of a rotation of heating and cooling. And not only that, 
when when you put the cups on top of the machine, um, it holds all that heat inside of the body of the machine where all of your electronics are located. Um, and that's not good just simply because it's going to degrade the components uh, much quicker than if it were able to, to ventilate. So my, my u- usual um, suggestion is that if you're going to put a lot on top of the machine, load it about two-thirds, but allow maybe the center um, of the, the cup tray to remain free so that air can flow out the top of it. Is this, the center is generally where most of the heat pools? No, but I, just from um, a use standpoint, you're going to grab cups from either the left or the right side. So, oh, right. yeah, so just just leave the center open and 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 paper cups is is it's all. This is just kind of a pet peeve, really, more than anything. It, putting a thousand paper cups on top of a machine doesn't look cool. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> no. It doesn't. I, I, I hate <laughs> it just that. It doesn't look cool. But at the same time, I think people get excited about the idea that they get to restock. And next thing you know, you've got all these paper cups on top. But I think if giving consideration to what you're actually going to use on a shift mm. might be better. Oh, it's such a great game that, you know, cup stacking <laughs> is a, a sport, Terry. And <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've, I've got nothing to do but see if I can fit all this sleeve and not just have four left over. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. So don't stock that too much and just, you know, pay attention to the way the machine is supposed to work with the convection heat. That's important. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, your next thing in here is pretty straightforward. Um, but people kind of test the limits of it, uh, based on budget, based on, you know, it's okay as an excuse. And it's, if it's broke, fix it. People kind of drop the ball on that one what's behind that i'm sure you've seen all sorts of excuses well i think it's just you know deferred maintenance is always a problem with with most any you know restaurant equipment and um, in the instance of espresso machines small things like um, an anti-siphon or purge valve uh, leaking a little bit of steam um, oh we'll get to that on the next service or a steam valve that is leaking out the the steam one end of the machine. Um, those can be problematic as well because if the steam wand is, is leaking through the steam tip all the time, the steam wand is live and hot. So you're going to risk chances of people getting burned on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but more importantly, um, well, I shouldn't say more importantly because actually getting <laughs> is a pretty important thing, right? Um, but, you know, also the steam leak will have a tendency to literally eat away the metal where it's leaking out through corrosion and that causes more damage so the sooner you you know that there's a steam leak or a water leak the the better off you are uh, you know taking care of it now rather than deferring it to the third quarter of the year where it might cost you a whole lot more in extra parts that have worn because of the leaks Okay, that may, it makes sense. Um, I think the frugality uh, that we have to have in operating a coffee bar causes us to push that limit um, because a lot of people don't have the knowledge to um, fix something like that. So they have to call a local, you know, somebody who might charge more than they're willing to pay or, or feel comfortable paying. Um what kind of a budget? I mean, this is sort of a, a left field question, but it, it seems to me that people would do well to put money aside for these types of things uh, when they happen because they will happen. Um, what are the most common things that you sh- you think people should uh, put money aside for? And generally, what have you seen has been helpful if people are putting money aside? Like how much uh, for, let's say, like a, a two group uh, linear single, um, cafe. So I think, you know, that the average cafe on espresso equipment maintenance, um, budgeting somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% of the original cost of your machine per year towards maintaining it isn't really out of line. That's going to cover all your group maintenance, um, purge valves, pretty standard things that you would want to replace, um, on a quarterly or, or biannual basis. So steam valves need to be rebuilt and 
um, they should be rebuilt every six months. And so well, I guess you know, one of the, the things that we say at Cafe Works is that preventative me- maintenance means fixing it before it breaks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's difficult for us to, to do these things just as a society. It's like we buy, we buy insurance for our cars pretty much because we have to, right? Right. And it's nice when it's there when we need it. In the instance of maintenance on, on the machines, we can't really see why we'd want, want to do it because there's nothing failed. But um, when we get a little further down the list, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit more about that. But the overall idea of maintenance on the machine and what, what to budget, I would say anywhere from um, five to $750 a year per machine on a two group mm. would, would, be, would be an adequate um, amount of money to budget for maintenance. Um, the, the program through the SCA with the Coffee Technicians Guild has been really interesting to follow. I, I, and when I say follow, I, I follow a lot of the techs um, on Instagram that use that hashtag. And they post some pretty amazing pictures of uh, machines with deferred maintenance. Um, <laughs> And, That's uh, a very nice way to put it. Yeah, and they, um, you know, they, they're they're a little more outspoken about it than um, than I, I guess you know I, I would be in in that sense just because it's the the wear and tear is is really avoidable, and um, when, when these pictures get posted, it's it's great because the other people are seeing the type of damage that can occur by by not doing preventative maintenance, um, it, and it's good and it's good business for these guys that are out there doing it. And I'm thankful for for all of them that are out there working on espresso equipment. It's not it's not a real um, easy gig for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, you know everybody everybody wants you to come at the end of the day. Nobody wants you to show up during. During your shift, right, right, <laughs> when the stores open, so, and, and unfortunately, they can't all be at the same place at, at closing. So, um, you know, when you give consideration to preventative maintenance um, and having a tech come into your shop, you know, kind of work with them on on their, their available times as well. Um, and if that's the reason why you're deferring maintenance, is because you don't want the tech to come in and shut down your store for the time that it's going to take to to do the PM. Um, start thinking about the other side of it is that if the machine goes down, it could be a lot more expensive and a lot more time uh, or downtime. Right. Very good points. Yeah. Just bite the bullet. See it uh, pay off in the fact that maybe you'll go a whole year without some kind of major catastrophe. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's also important to note that um, most technicians are also baristas and, um, so they, they get it, you know, they're coming into your store and they, and they do understand. And when you're a technician standing behind the counter and you have the machine tore down mm-hmm. for PM and customers come in, you're not the guy they want to see. So, <laughs> you know, ha- having, a, having a, um, a, a pretty light personality and, and uh, the ability to kind of just smile through uh, some of the stresses that come with standing there while people want their coffee um, is important. Preventative maintenance, it's do or die, really. Yep. And um, the next on your list is something not attached to the espresso machine, but something that is so integral to a coffee overall, and that's water, water filtration, uh, and maintaining that. And I know for a fact there have been times where it's just got away from me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like six months out of date from the recommended switch time, and, and, and then the coffee tastes so much better after you change the filter, and I feel so guilty. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. you're, not, you're not the only one. I'm, you know, I've opened up cabinets and found water filters that were 10 years old. Mm. And, you know, the, those, that's not an uncommon thing to find water filters that are out of spec at a cafe. So I, I, I would say that it's a very small percentage of, of operators that actually maintain these on um, a preventative maintenance type of um, schedule. So some water filters, you know, are, 
are specced to run a particular amount of gallons before they need to be replaced. And unless you are aware of your daily usage of water through the espresso machine, it's hard to gauge. Um, some reverse osmosis systems um, have meters on them that will tell you how many gallons have gone through, and that's, that's helpful. But um, at the same time, um, while um, I, I speak to the need of water filters, um, I'm not a water expert by any means, and there are people in the industry that know far more about water than I do. But what I do know um, is that water is essentially the enemy, um, and it runs through the machine all day long. And how we treat it before it gets to the machine is very important. And there needs to be some form of water filtration in front of the machine um, before we start making coffee with it. And I imagine the types of filtration that you're choosing have more to do with what your water needs are locally than they do anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And e even in that in that standpoint, I can um, share this this story. Is that I I live in Olympia, Washington, where our our water is really quite good. Um, it runs through um, municipal water system pipes, and along the way, that really great water picks up uh, minerals. And um, I can test it at the water meter outside of a building, and it'll be within spec. But as it enters into a building, it might be passing through 100-year-old galvanized pipes um, or just you know, poor quality old piping in a building and where it will pick up, pick up and, and lose its quality um, before it gets to even the water filter or the machine. So those are things to give consideration to is that sometimes people will get the spec for their water from their um, local city government and pass that along to the espresso machine um, supplier and say, here's what our water is. Um, really, the water needs to be tested at the source that it's going to be uh, feeding the espresso machine. Oh, geez. I mean, I feel like every city or maybe every large city-ish, largest city has an award for their water at some somewhere right. on their wall. <laughs> we do in Louisville. It's like, oh, we have the cleanest drinking water. I'm like, yeah, okay. And every city has weather that always changes. But so... Uh, right. what's new. So yeah, that's, I've never really thought about that, but that, that kind of plumbing issue going into the building, that's, that's an unknown. That's huge. Yeah. You just, you just don't know what minerals or credits going to pick up as it passes through the, the building's, uh, water system. Uh, well, how, how do we know that our filters, I mean, outside of just saying, you know, if it's been, over X number of months, like what are some indicators that we need to replace our filters? Well, if it's just a basic filter, an inline filter or a cartridge with a mounting head, um, there's really no way to know <laughs> um, unless the, there's a gauge that's mounted on the mounting head. And then, and then you can see what your water pressure is. Um, and normally if it has a gauge on it, when I set a new filter in, I'll mark the location of the needle on the gauge and note that on the side of the filter body. Um, that way I can look back in and if, if it was originally at 80 and uh, a month later it's dropped down to 40 PSI, I might give consideration to changing it. Mm. Um, in the instance where it doesn't have a gauge, um, it really is difficult to know when that filter um, is no longer useful. A lot of filters have bypasses in them, so that's good. They won't plug and, and stop water flow directly, but reduced water flow is a good indicator that the filter needs to be replaced. Okay, and I guess that would presuppose that you already know what your water flow is in the beginning. Right, right. And, then, and I also like to mention is that water filtration should only... Um, in the instance of the, the filter that's going to the equipment, should really only feed the equipment. You don't need it to go to the sinks and all that other stuff. And if, if you want filtered water at your sinks, put in, a, in another system that is dedicated to just drinking water and the water used for ice is an, another one that's entirely different than the water going to the espresso machine. So maybe three, like espresso machine, brewer, and ice? Yep. I, I kind of, a lot of people say my, my concept around water, water filtration is a bit overkill. 
but at the same time, um, an ice machine water filter often has a, 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 a descaler or a anti-scale type of um, product built into it that isn't the best thing to use on an espresso machine. So having those that water line connected to both units is non-beneficial. So, um, yeah, definitely having um, and giving consideration to separate water filtration systems for um, your ice and drinking water and uh, your coffee brewing equipment would be really important. Even on an RO system, I would I would take a look at how that water is, is being distributed before um, actually doing all your plumbing and everything. So it's really important that when, especially on new build outs that you work with your plumber so that they have a really clear understanding of what you're trying to um, filter. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. I think this is uh, giving people a lot of ideas and <laughs> they're putting some things on their to-do lists for tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> um, so we're here now at number nine, which is um, what we've heard uh, in a previous episode from someone who is sort of, I don't know, I'd say a protege of yours, uh, Tom. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Tom at Workhorse. Mm -hmm. Tom over at Workhorse uh, gave us some uh, tech tips and he was bragging on uh, your genius with the baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws. And, and actually now you have uh, a subscription business built around this. So let's let's start by talking about uh, baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws and their importance. And then maybe tell us a little bit about you know what you're doing to make sure that we all get taken care of. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, first the, the, the terms baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws um, came to us by, by way of a preventative maintenance course that we were giving at the Coffee Fest um, shows. And um, it was just this mantra that we kept repeating through the, through the classes as, as, as um, the idea that um, in maintaining baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws, um, you will have a better quality coffee program. And, and we'll talk about that as, as I talk about these parts. So the, you know, the wear items in, in the brew group and just the components in the brew group are some of the last, not necessarily untouched pieces of the third wave coffee um, process, but we, we had, we paid a lot of attention to the other parts of the machine and temperature control and, and steam and all these things. And, um, there's been some work within uh, the brew group um, with screens and baskets and how um, they affect coffee. Um, baskets are one that a lot of people will spend time talking about in the instance of the volume that they hold, um, the brand that they are, um, but nobody really discusses how often they should be replaced. So what we what we say is that if you're an average cafe and you're in a preventative maintenance program that is fairly steady, um, it would be a quarterly suggestion to change all of these parts at the same time. So um, and the reason for that is consistency. So in the, let's say in the instance that um, the right group, um, the the basket needs to be replaced, so you just replace that one basket on the right group portafilter. Um, your flow rate through that basket is entirely different than the old baskets in the, the middle or left group, say it's a three, um, because it's new. And the best way to, to, to visualize this is if you have a new basket, just hold it in your hand and load it full of water. The water is going to just statically sit there. It's not going to flow through the basket. Um, 18 grams, uh, an 18 gram basket holds a small quantity of water. And if it's new, the water will just sit there and it might leak out a little bit. In the basket that is worn, take that same basket, fill it up with water and the water just pours right through. Mm. And that's because the holes in the basket have worn. So what we're doing is we're forcing hot water under 135 PSI pressure, or nine bar, um, and coffee grounds through these little tiny holes. And the coffee grounds act as an abrasive. 
and then the pressure and the, and the flexing of the metal um, cause these holes to open up. And as the holes open up, the, the coffee flows through them faster. Wow. I, I would so, never have thought to check it that way. And I've always seen like the bottom of a basket warp so that it's round instead of flat, but I haven't right? thought to check the uh, porosity of the, of the holes. Yeah, that's a, a good way to just kind of show the, the, the difference between a new basket and, and a used basket and, and why it is important to change them out um, periodically. So the, the other thing that can happen with baskets is just that stress of um, pressure being applied to them all day long you know, on and off, on and off. And as the bottom of the, the basket, um, as you mentioned, can kind of turn into kind of a convex shape um, because of that flexing, the the very edge or the bottom edge of the basket where it goes from the sidewall to the flat um, portion where the holes are um, can develop stress cracks. And the stress cracks might be visual to you but often what you'll find is coffee grounds in your cup. Oh. And you're wondering, how in the world do those coffee grounds get there? Um, you know, sometimes it, that happens if, if they're on the bottom of the spout, and you'll get grounds in. But in this instance, let's say you're using a, a bottomless portafilter and you're um, getting grounds in the cup. It's probably there's a little seam, the uh, seam crack in the side of the basket. And I have visuals for that for the classes because it's, so it's easier to show. But um, basically, you won't see that crack until it's under pressure. And then the pressure forces the crack open and grounds are able to get into the cup. Right. Wow. So, so another good reason to change baskets. Yeah, it seems like the basket is just the beefier piece of the equation. So we maybe subconsciously think it, it's always good and we don't need to change it because it's it's sturdier and uh, yeah everything else that's thinner or smaller probably needs to be needs to be changed out. I don't know, um, but you have this program now for uh, a subscription for baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws. And it, 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 how does that run? Does it run quarterly, like you were saying for the um, for the ideal maintenance for those things? Yeah, we have it set up so that you can kind of choose the the time frames that you're you're wanting to put your preventive maintenance program into the um the idea here is to find a system that's going to work for you and and then just stick with it so busy cafes you know we're saying busy cafe 30 plus pounds a week go quarterly if if you're 30 pounds less a week you could probably get by just fine biannually and um the idea is, is that what we do, we put together these kits, these maintenance kits, it arrives at your door and it's a reminder that the work needs to be done <laughs> and it's very simple work. So it can be done on at the close. It's really, um, group maintenance is really no different than, um, group cleaning at the end of the night with the exception that you're going to replace the gasket. Um, so Preventative maintenance, again, is, you know, fixing it before it breaks. And we often have a tendency to not take the time or not remember to order the parts to do it. So that was the concept around um, baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws. Um, and we shortened up the, the name to just BGSS <laughs> to make it a little bit easier um, is so that the, you don't have to remember. We'll remember for you. And we'll, we'll send out quality parts based upon your choices um, w when you're building up your subscription. So we feel that it's a, it's a, a good way for um, independent cafes and um, even corporations to maintain their, their espresso equipment without having to give a lot of consideration to when. Nice. That's brilliant. And uh, people should stay tuned uh, till uh, after the interview. We'll give details because you guys are giving away uh, two subscriptions to Keys to the Shop listeners. Details to follow. So thank you for that. It's super generous. Yeah. And uh, let's let's get into number 10 here on the your top 10 list. And 
that's operation training. And we kind of touched on that a little bit here, and it's been a theme throughout, you know, empowering baristas and, and learning about the equipment. Talk to us about equipment training and its importance in the cafe. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as an industry, we, we and in particular in, in the third wave, we have spent a lot of time um, on coffee quality from sourcing and roasting um, preparation. Um, and that there's still just a couple of pieces in all of that. They could be a little bit better. And I think that that's just having a solid knowledge and, um, of coffee and the operation of the equipment, um, as, as an operator, you know, owner operator and the staff as baristas, it should be all encompassing. Really. It should be every, every aspect of coffee, um, should be given consideration. It's, I think it's, it's something that a lot of people can't, give consideration to because they're really they're, they're into either the latte art or just the coffee itself and there's just components but when you take a look at all of the the bits and pieces the machine is really the part that we need to be spending a little bit of more time and effort on um, and having a better understanding of it as well as other components inside of the the shop and grinders and um, if you have any you know automatic other other pieces of equipment it's good to know how they operate. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think employees are, are more than capable. You know, we hire, uh, you know, adults who are, you know, thinking beings with in a, a passion for coffee. And if we start them right out of the gates with, you know, being entrusted with a, a good information and, and we ourselves pursue that information, it just seems like, we're going to, you know, maintain our equipment better and have more pride in our work. We'll pay less money to uh, for people to come in in emergency mode overnight, so we can get that Saturday morning rush. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that you know, um, a barista as a career is is something that didn't necessarily exist when I first got involved in coffee. Um, and it's something that I really strive to help develop was uh, seeing um, the barista role as a career uh, possibility. Um, when I first started in, in the industry, it was very much a stepping stone job. So you went to work at the coffee shop, you know, after school type of thing. Um, but I know hundreds of people now, literally hundreds of people who have chosen to make their career being a professional barista. And those people understand um, more than just how to make coffee. They, they understand all of the ins and outs of what they're doing for the most part. And um, the equipment is, is one of those things. And I've, I've found that um, many of these uh, folks go from um, being a barista, having an interest in being a coffee roaster um, and learning that or learning how to be an espresso machine technician is um, seems to be um, one of the things that um, a lot of people bring to my attention is um, as baristas they'll say you know I'm really interested in, in knowing more about the machine and you know maybe working on them and um, I think that's great because um, there is a large void of espresso machine technicians out in the overall uh, industry and those that are out there that do a great job do a great job and we just need more of them. Um, and that way, um, in areas like New York, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, the operators who are here in abundance um, have um, the ability to get their equipment repaired uh, quickly. Um, so having someone on staff that has some of that knowledge is also a, a very good idea. I think that um, empowering somebody with that ability to um, take a look at um, a simple repair and allowing them to do that um, is is really something that could lead to somebody um, having a career change or um, a, f a future want to do something more in espresso equipment. Well said. Yeah, I, I see that lack in the industry, but I, I hope that uh, you know folks listening to this episode would be inspired to pursue that themselves and. You're you're uh, getting back into teaching actually uh, your courses you're teaching at Coffee Fest Espresso Machine Maintenance uh, coming up this yeah. next year right? 
Yeah, we took a, a, a about a six six or seven year hiatus from teaching, and uh, we're going to be uh, going back uh, working with the folks uh, in the Coffee Fest series to uh, do um, a beginner course on espresso machine maintenance, and um, then a, another more advanced course on espresso machine repair and maintenance. And um, it's something that. Um, it's quite interesting to have attendees come into a room and in particular, let's say on the beginners that um, I'll, I'll ask folks in the room if they know what brand of machine they have. And um, it's a, it's quite surprising how many people don't know the brand of the, of the machine that they own. Mm. And, and that's something that is, is important um, so that when <laughs> you do need to call the technician, you can um, let him know what, he might need to bring parts for. It's interesting when I when I first started working on espresso equipment, um, most of the espresso machines that were imported to the United States just by chance were red. It just kind of seemed to be the color. La Pavonis and Gajas, everybody's all their machines were red. And um, so I'd call a you know a shop would call me and and I'd say, well, what, what kind of machine do you have? And they'd be like, I don't know, it's red. <laughs> like, okay, well that narrows it down. Well, that'll um, help your mechanic too. If you go in there to get a Get some engine work done. Tell them that your model is red. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you know also know, knowing what what mo- brand and model of equipment you have is is good for the technician because um, he may be able to just simply walk you through a, a telephone fix. Oh, been there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Telephone fixes are great because uh, that that keeps the technician uh, available for other calls and uh, reduces uh, your cost in getting something fixed. It could be something really simple. This has really been a great conversation. I feel like it's very empowering and equipping. Thank you, Terry, for taking so much time to kind of dissect these things for us and lay it out in such a a clear way. How can people learn uh, more about what you're up to over at the Cafe Works? Yeah, so um, Cafe Works is myself and my daughter, Sarah Michaelman, and um, we have been developing products here for the last few years um, under the brand Cafe Works. And so we have um, two websites at uh, cafeworks.com and we spell it really funny. So it made it difficult for you to understand where it is. So it's um, C-A-F-F-E-W-E-R-K-S.com. And then the subscription service is a uh, website address is B-G-S-S Pro, as in professional, dot com. And um, the BGSS is baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws. So you can see some of our work at uh, either website. We have a, a few other projects in kind of the ether out there that link back to uh, Cafe Works as well that you can read about um, on that website. So excellent. Yeah. So definitely recommend people go and check that out. And uh, again, thank you so much, Terry. It was really great to uh, have you on the show. And uh, just hear your wisdom related to this thing. You've, you've made us better professionals. Well, that's that's my overall goal in all this is just to pass on the knowledge that I have. Um, when I got started, you know, there, this wasn't available. So if if that's what I can do to to help people know more, that that's uh, that's that's what I'm hopeful for. So excellent. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. So again, I'm really glad to have gotten a chance to interview. Terry, for this episode. Uh, Out of all the people you could choose to listen to uh, about espresso tech, Terry is my number one pick. So thank you very much, Terry, for taking the time to share with us all that you've learned over the course of your uh, amazing career in working with equipment. Uh, We will work hard to put these things into practice regularly. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of this stuff could just be a reminder for you. There are things that you might be doing on a regular basis, um, but it's not that we don't know some of the things we might not know, but we, it's not like we don't know a lot of this. It's just that we don't, we don't discipline ourselves to do it on a regular basis. And that's the key component is regular preventative maintenance. You know, it's like when you brush your teeth, you got to do that every day, twice a day, maybe. Um, and if you skip days, there is going to be a buildup over time. And without that preventative maintenance, it's going to be more expensive in the long run. And the same thing applies to your espresso machine. Um, Regular application of these principles is the key. 
And, you know, Terry's business, Baskets, Gaskets, Screens, and Screws, uh, BGSS, is taking some of that uh, hassle out of the equation for you. And here is where we're going to be having this giveaway. Terry and Sarah at Cafe Works have generously offered Keys to the Shop listeners a chance at a one-year-long subscription to the Baskets, Gaskets, Screens, and Screws subscription service. Um, And we're going to have two winners. So how do you enter? Here's how you enter. Just go to Instagram, follow Cafe Works, follow Keys to the Shop. And on this episode's Instagram post, in the comments, tag two coffee professional friends and then comment which one of Terry's top 10 uh, best practices you thought was most valuable in this episode. So follow both the accounts on Instagram, tag two coffee professional friends, comment what you thought was the best uh, tip from this episode, and you will be entered to win. And I will announce the winner on the January 1st episode, which is the following Tuesday uh, in the new year. So start the new year out right. Two cafes are going to get fresh baskets, gaskets, screens, and screws. Thanks very much to Terry and Sarah for their generosity. Um, and good luck to all of you. Now, if you want the show notes for this show, as always, you can go to keys to the shop.com and on the sidebar, there's a place for you to enter your email address. But when you do that, you'll be receiving the email every two weeks that will have the show notes, the basic uh, key takeaways from each episode and the links mentioned in each episode, the resources and, you know, emails and things like that, um, websites for the guests, etc. Uh, those will all be in the newsletter, as well as news, of course, from Keys to the Shop and other links that I come across that are going to be helpful for your professional development. So go to keystotheshop.com, enter your email address and get signed up for the newsletter. If you want to contact me directly, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you have comments or questions, feedback, suggestions for uh, future episodes or, or, you know, topics and guests. That would be fantastic. Or if you want to reach out and set up a phone call to talk about Keys to the Shop Consulting, helping you and your business or your career, be more than happy to do that as well. So again, that's chris at keystotheshop.com. And that's it for today's episode. I truly appreciate all of you listening. Good luck in the giveaway. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.